Excuse me, what do you think of our computers? We're a bit terrified of them. Well, I think they're very wonderful. For years now, we went to com uh, calculators, and now we've got computers, which are the thing of the age, aren't they? They help us do more things more efficiently and quickly. I think they're here to stay, definitely. Well, I think they'll be all right. I think they'll improve things and make a lot of difference, I think, when we get them going, all right? We haven't got one, <laughs> and we must fly. <laughs> we're going to the West End. OK. Uh, we now tend, in some respects, to be ruled by them whereas before I could ring somebody up and get an answer straight away, I'd say it's in the computer and you've got to wait till the answer comes out. This plastic society we live in, man, it needs to scapegoat, it goes to computers. Yeah, like wild. Computers? What are they? Well, I personally believe that we're on the verge of a revolution in the conditions of human life that's going to make the Industrial Revolution seem completely trivial by comparison. And this revolution, I think, is going to be brought about by computers. This is a computer. At the moment, it is doing absolutely nothing. But in a few seconds, a steel bar will approach hot from the mill. No one knows its exact length. With these photocells, the computer will measure the length precisely. Then it will run through a list of the 61 customers who have ordered this bar in various lengths and will determine the best way to cut it to leave no waste. This fairly minor computer saves its owners about £100,000 per year. This computer is busy. It is controlling a Czech reader sorter. On this day, there are more than a million checks to be dealt with, and each machine handles 25 checks a second. The computer will note the branch number, the account number, the serial number, and the amount of each check. And it will calculate totals cross totals and balances for each of thousands of branches. The banks are so busy nowadays that without computers, their work would never get done. This computer contains a mass of information. Its memory holds all the details of all the flights of a great airline for one year ahead. The computer is in London, but a web of communications connects it to remote terminals across the world. To have your seat to New York at about 11 o'clock on the 12th, I'll check for you, just a second. Yes, sir, we do have seats available. Without the computer, this airline would have more empty seats and passengers would get a slower and less convenient service. Fine, Mr. Barton, your flight is confirmed, also your hotel accommodation, and we have requested a vegetarian meal on board for you. Thank you very much. This computer is comparing blood samples with a standard. At this instant, it is studying Doreen Smith. She's been feeling below par for no reason the doctor can discover, so she was given a complete check by autoanalytical techniques controlled and analyzed by the computer. A computer can compare scores of readings with hundreds of different combinations of symptoms to detect any indication of a latent disease. If Doreen has something wrong, the computer will recognize its early stages. This gives her doctor a much better chance of curing her. Four different computers doing four quite different jobs. Controlling steel cutting, keeping records of flights, calculating bank balances, making deductions about latent disease. Each computer is dealing with facts and figures. Each one, in quite different ways, is processing information. In fact, any one of the computers could have done any one of the jobs. Computers are general purpose machines which handle information. Information. A child is born. A tree is felled. A pocket is empty. A check paid. A choice is made. And so on and Every fact about the world is information can be handled by computers as long as it can be expended. 38, 22, 36. Any profile, any shape, any fact, or any theory about the material world can be exactly described by sets of numbers. The number system that humans use is based on 10, because long ago people found their 10 fingers the easiest way of counting. Computers work by electricity. They can be designed to count by using 10 levels of electric current. But the difference between each level is slight. Much more clear-cut is a symbol off or on. 
members use the on-off circuits as a way of representing members. A single lamp can represent one when it is on and naught when it is off. With two lamps, the one on the right stands for ones, the one on the left for twos, and numbers of up to three can be represented. One, two, two plus one, making three. With another lamp standing for fours, you can count to seven. Four plus one, five. Four plus two, six. Four plus two plus one, seven. Each digit to the left is twice the previous one. So on, off, on, on represents eight plus two plus one, eleven. You can use as many lamps as you like, so any number can be handled. With 20 lamps, you can represent all the numbers up to a million. With 30 lamps, over 250 million. This is a convenient way of counting for electrical machines like computers. Adding by electricity is easy. It can be done by a simple circuit with one double switch and one single one. The lamps will show the answer in binary digits. One on the right, two on the left. The switches are marked zero in one position and one in the other. Naught plus naught equals naught, so the lamps don't light. Naught plus one, and the lamp shows one. One plus naught, again one. One plus one, two. The same circuit can subtract. Two, take away one, answer one. This kind of arithmetic is called binary. With modern materials, the same circuits can be made in microscopic sizes. This tiny slice of silicon contains hundreds of complete circuits. Each circuit is individually tested before it is ready for installing in the computer. Wiring these logic elements is one of the biggest problems. Computers don't have just one or two logic elements. They have thousands or tens of thousands which is why modern computers can solve very large and complicated problems. Computers may be wonderful, but they're a great big black box. I don't know how you get sense into them or out of them, for that matter. It isn't helpful to think of the computer as a single mysterious black box. If anything, it is five black boxes, intricately connected together. First, the input. All the information the computer requires is fed in here. At the other end is the output. Through this, the computer delivers the results of its calculations. An arithmetic unit, or logic unit, does the actual calculation. The memory, or store, contains all the information the computer needs to solve the particular problem. Finally, the control unit, which keeps all the other parts working in the proper sequence. These black boxes, in fact, are never black. Most manufacturers have their individual color schemes. The input to a computer feeds in all the information and instructions. A punched card is a common way of doing it. The holes represent digits. The machine does the translation. For example, when a name is typed, it automatically appears on the card in the appropriate code. These cards can be read by the computer at high speed, about a thousand a minute. Paper tape input, again, has holes or no holes, representing digits. It's a convenient input when there is a modest amount of information to be fed in. Magnetic tape is ideal for handling large amounts of information. Just as tape can record every note of a symphony orchestra, so when storing binary, one inch of tape can hold 2,800 spots magnetized in alternative directions representing one or naught. A reel of tape is generally 2,400 feet. One reel can hold the names, wage rates, tax position, overtime, and many other details of 10,000 people. The computer's memory, or information store, like man's, requires access to information at different levels of priority. A man will keep in his mind a score or two of the telephone numbers he most commonly uses. In the computer, this immediate access memory usually consists of tiny magnetic cores, 
possibly millions of them. Each can be magnetized in one of two ways to store either one or zero. Information in this store is available in millionths of a second. This immediate memory must be able to hold all the data actually being worked on. Other information may be needed rapidly, but in thousandths of a second, rather than millionths. For this, there are several types of intermediate store. Rotating magnetic disks are one, with as much capacity as the job needs. Then we need a backup to faster types of memory. Magnetic tape machines can store almost limitless information, but access to them may take seconds or even minutes. The arithmetic or logic unit contains a mass of circuitry, but really it is only a very large number of binary adders and similar logic elements linked together in various ways. There are various forms of computer output, but the line printer is one of the most important. It will print its results in any convenient form. The control unit is the last of the five main components. It is electronically linked to all the other units and ensures that every operation of the computer is done in precise sequence under complete control. Control, control, control. Every day you read in the newspapers that computers are controlling something else. It's my belief that the government will link up all the computers and will all be controlled and there'll be no freedom left. Computers certainly could help to destroy human freedom. Equally, they could enlarge it. Computers can help man to build or to destroy. They can make war or peace. Computers are fundamentally different from all earlier types of calculating machines because they must be given a list of instructions. Give dangerous instructions, the result is dangerous. Give stupid instructions and the answer will be stupid. Computer men have a saying, G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. The list of instructions to the computer is called the program. Say you need to write a program for controlling a chemical works. First you have to find out all the facts about the plant, all the relationships between the parts of the system. Then they must be sorted into a logical sequence of alternatives. This is a long job, teamwork usually. It is called systems analysis. A chemical plant has many different raw materials. They may come from many sources. They can be processed in many different plants, in many combinations. Countless different products can be made in different proportions with different values. With millions of possible choices, it's no wonder that the management want computer programs to discover the most efficient method of operating the plant. For this chemical works, the systems analysis and the programming took 78 man years of highly skilled effort. But the basic way these problems are tackled can be shown in a much simpler case. In this problem, there are two raw materials, hot water and cold water. The hot is more expensive and should not be wasted. One product is required, a bath at 33 degrees centigrade, at least 10 inches deep. The systems analyst breaks it down into a series of alternatives. Turn on hot tap. Is water below 33 degrees centigrade? Yes. Turn off hot water. No bath. Is water below 33? No. Is water above 33? Yes. Turn on cold tap a quarter turn. Is water above 33? No. Is water below 10 inches? Yes. Wait half a minute and try again. Is water above or below 10 inches? No. Turn off taps and jump in. With the systems analysis done, the next job is to write a step-by-step -step program for the computer. Programs these days are written in special languages some rather like basic English, some more exotic. The computers have their own internal programs, called compilers, which translate the program language into the basic codes which instruct the arithmetic unit. Writing a program is laborious, but once it's written and tested, it can be used any number of times. 
Consider a sum of this kind. Ten simultaneous equations describing the complete operations of a car valve assembly. It would take a top mathematician using a good desk calculator years to solve with a fair chance of being wrong. But it is a typical kind of mathematical problem and so there is a program available to solve it. The program and data are in the computer. Key in your name, request the answer and in a few seconds it will appear on the screen. This is the fantastic power of the computer. Enormous speed and absolute accuracy. Absolute accuracy, absolute balderdash. Whenever I complain of inefficiency or bad service, from no matter who it is, they always seem to answer, oh, didn't you know, we're going over to computers. Oh, send somebody a dud invoice, did you? It wasn't me. It was the bloody computer. Now, hang on. Those things are expensive. Is it yours? Yes, and it was. Mm. Mm, it's very nice. They don't make mistakes, you know. Don't they? Oh, no. If something wrong comes out, it's because somebody put something wrong in. Uh, don't you know much about them? No, no I, I rely on the um, technical chaps. Uh, tell me, why did you buy it? Well, we're a big organization, and, and from looking around at what other people like us were doing, well, I, I thought we needed one. Hmm. To do the bills and things? Yes. Yeah. It, it has had a spectacular effect on all the accounting and on the um, stock keeping. Spectacular? Well, apart from the boobs. But, my God, the reorganization it took in those departments. It was absolute chaos during the changeover. Which you could have avoided if you'd been properly prepared. I suppose so, yeah. Hmm. Is that all you wanted it for? High-powered counting and uh, instant memory? Well, the computer is the tool of modern management. Oh? Uh, how do you mean, management? Uh, what sort of things? <laughs> Look here, I, I do know what management is about. Like, basically, it's three things. To make the business profitable and efficient, uh, to look after the workers, and uh, to make sure the shareholders get a proper return. And the customer? Oh, yes, um, satisfy the customer, of course. Yeah. Well, that's pretty comprehensive. That must include every man and process in the whole organization. Oh, it does. To be a manager means to be responsible for everything. Hmm. And exactly how are these management problems going to be put to the computer in order to get the useful answers out of it? Well, I'll tell the computer boys what I want to know. And they know as much about your whole business as you do? Oh, no. Well, then, where will they get the data to work on? Oh, well, God damn it! I mean, I'll tell all my people to give them any facts they need. It took a lot of reorganization, didn't it, to get the computer working properly on your figure stuff, which is fairly simple for the computer. Yes. Well, doesn't it seem likely that to get the most out of the computer on these complicated matters, you'll need a rather extensive examination of your whole outfit, its whole way of working? My God, that'll take a year. Well, if I were you, I'd send this lot back until you're ready for it. Otherwise, it'll just be garbage in and garbage out. Preparing problems for computer solution is a very demanding task. In a large firm, it may need hundreds of people. You don't have to be a mathematician to be a programmer or systems analyst. Just someone with a good mind who enjoys solving problems. The most important quality, obviously, is clear thinking. Remember G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Systems and programs must be planned to give the computer information that is complete and accurate. And the user must know what answers he wants, in what form, and why he wants them. The arrival of a computer will certainly change the lives of management and workers, but it should be for the better. The way the world is going, we surely need the help of computers. You can use television to watch the traffic, but the problem's too complex, too dynamic, for the human mind to sort it all out and make useful decisions. So keep the human beings on watch for human emergencies, but let the computer analyze the whole traffic situation, compare all the routes, change the lights and direction signs, and make the traffic flow. With computer traffic control, there may be hold-ups, 
but without it, they are far, far worse. The sky, too, is getting crowded. Computers don't yet control air traffic, but they do sort out all the shifting facts and present continuous, up-to-date information to the human controller. Okay. November Golf, loud and clear. These days, you don't have to go to a computer center to get information or solve a problem. In this factory store, the computer presents information in normal language and abbreviations. The touch of the storekeeper's finger feeds an order or inquiry straight into the computer, and the answer comes straight back. The architect can design straight onto the computer, and it will work out for him the cost, the materials, and the time the job will take. If he changes the details, the computer will change the calculation and finally print out everything he needs to know. With another program, he can find out the amount of daylight given by the windows in his design. At the touch of a button, the computer shows the light distribution in the room. The designer, who requires a complex three-dimensional shape, part of a car body, for example, can start with a flat sheet, manipulate it in any way, and observe it from any viewpoint. And then the computer will automatically produce an exact blueprint, or just as easily, it will control the actual machine tool that does the job. Computers are meant to make work easier. Those springs are going to foul in a crash stop. I don't see why they should. Anyway, let's check. If you're designing a monorail and you have a problem with the springing, no panic rush to reference books. Hire yourself a share of a computer and use the program called Coils. Tell the computer what it wants to know and it designs the coil spring for you. The speed of the logic unit is so much greater than the input and output speeds that the computer handles this and many other tasks apparently at the same time. More and more people are coming into everyday contact with computers. In thousands of banks, computer terminals are taking over much of the clerical and accounting work. Relieved of most of the clerical drudgery, a smaller and more intelligent staff can spend more of its time on the interesting and human job of dealing with customers. The man on the shop floor can already be in instant communication with the computer. And the day is coming when the computer will carry out unskilled manual jobs as it has already taken over unskilled clerical ones. With more computing power, we shall cease to waste people on low-grade manual work and find better uses for human talents. Some young people are already being taught by the computer. A generation is growing up which will find the computer terminal as familiar as electric light or the telephone. And we are only just at the beginning of the computer age. I suppose computers are all right, but I don't know what all the fuss is about because they're not really very revolutionary, are they? We are at the beginning of a revolution. It depends on two facts, both of them proved, but neither of them as yet exploited. The first is that computers can be programmed to be intelligent. The second is that they can learn from experience. It's very hard to define intelligence, either human or machine. Usually, human intelligence is measured by carefully designed problems. Already, computers are as successful at these tests as university candidates, and sometimes even better. This is a sliding block puzzle, not of great interest, perhaps, in itself, but of immense usefulness to us in our attempts to develop general problem-solving and learning computer programs.
Computers are very good at doing a precisely defined job. It is difficult to produce programs that give them general abilities of the kind that is common to humans, but progress is being made. This computer has been given a number of facts. It is then asked a question which requires the power of deductive reasoning and gets it right. Gomo Q is a quite complex oriental game. The first person to get five stones in a row is the winner. The experienced player will always beat the novice. Here, a good player is playing a computer which has only the simplest tactical knowledge of the game. The computer plays the cross-hatched counters. The human wins the first game easily. But even by game three, the computer is quite hard to beat. As it examines possible moves, its memory is infallible. It will never make any move mathematically similar to one that led it to lose any previous game. But a good human player still wins. After about 16 games, the computer is virtually unbeatable. The more skilled the human opponent, the more the computer has learned, and the better player it has become. These examples may not seem very dramatic, but they are the beginnings of something quite new, as significant as when the first wheel rolled, the first gunpowder exploded, or rocket fired, when Watt saw a kettle lid rise, when Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny, when Marconi tapped out the first message, or when Rutherford first split the atom. One thing that computers won't be is selfish. Uh, I mean, human beings have a certain amount of selfishness built into them uh, in order to survive, and there's no reason why we should build that into computers. Today, computers are mindless slaves. They are becoming immensely powerful and versatile assistants. This is bringing about the greatest revolution that the human race has ever known, a revolution which will enhance the value of human talent but diminish the value of unskilled human labor. This revolution could lead to terrible consequences, or it could lead to the greatest advances ever for the human race. Which of these things are to happen is up to us.